Reunited opens with what has to be the longest song Steven Universe has featured thus far. Let's Only Think About Love was a grandiose musical number lasting nearly four minutes, and features Steven trying to spread joviality while also providing brief recaps of multiple events that occurred throughout the series. It also sets up many elements of the battle to come, and should have raised some massive red flags for anybody paying attention. And no future vision either! <laughs> okay. Well, there it is. Confirmation that Homeworld forces are going to arrive at some point during the wedding celebration and catch the Crystal Gems off guard. Sooner or later, the diamonds are going to come for the cluster. Peridot straight up states the exact thing that's going to happen later that evening. We can think about long lost friends we wish we were invited. The visuals accompanying Steven's line shows Lapis once again couldn't stay far from Earth and is continuing to bide her time on the moon. So that certainly set up Lapis having her heroic return in a pivotal moment. It's rather interesting just how much Reunited ends up flying in the face of the musical number it opens with. Taking a break from all your worries for just a single day is generally a good thing. Everybody needs some respite from negative thoughts, time away from the troubles and stress you face in your life, and it makes absolute sense to focus on happiness on a day where two loved ones are getting married. But it's nearly comedic that the one specific day Steven sings about ignoring bad stuff happens to be the day where that bad stuff turns out to be the most relevant. It was an interesting choice of tonal dissonance on the creator's part, that's for sure. The wedding itself was real cute. I love, love, love how Sapphire was dressed in a suit while Ruby got to wear a dress. It was a great switcheroo on the regular clothing they typically wear. Sapphire's coy nervousness was adorable, as was Ruby's burning enthusiasm. Literal burning enthusiasm. <laughs> Also, holy cow, Andy traveled all the way to Beach City to attend the wedding. Do you all remember Andy? Yeah, me neither. Ruby's vows are direct and silly. Sapphire gives her vows a cosmic flair, although keeps them from getting to the level of the tart toter from Adventure Time. And we get an awesome kiss! Finally, a big gay in-your-face kiss in an all-ages cartoon. Take that, Legend of Korra! Sorry, I'm still salty about how utterly platonic the ending of The Legend of Korra was, despite the creators stating otherwise. The wedding festivities party on, with notable events including Dewey and Jamie, the dejected heartbroken duo, dancing together, if you want to call that dancing. Bismuth also gets to meet what the Earthlings call a Ronaldo, and probably begins to question whether staying bubbled would have been a better choice. Bismuth also catches the bouquet, so perhaps the next fusion we will see will involve her? If not, that seems like a major missed opportunity for foreshadowing. The wedding portion of this two-part special is clearly winding down, however, and with Steven's unexpected tears, we enter Phase 2, where the episode's title, Reunited, will take on a brand new meaning. Yellow and Blue Diamond arrive to Earth, and they're feeling grabby. Grabby for the cluster, that is. So, question that I will then answer. Why fly to the outskirts of Beach City for this task? Beach City is in the eastern United States, the cluster's insertion point was in the western United States. Had the diamonds flew to the injection point instead, the Crystal Gems may not have even known what was happening until the cluster had already emerged. Well, here's my answer. That was probably the entire point. The Diamonds wanted the Remnant Crystal Gems to have front row seats for the big event. That was the goal. They wanted the Crystal Gems to feel dread and despair, although obviously that desire for vengeance backfired on them. I also did have the thought that maybe the Diamonds somehow realized a hole was drilled all the way to the cluster and they were going to utilize it for ease of access, but the handship doesn't even attack the hole left by the drill. So, nah, that had nothing to do with it. A question that I don't have a solid answer to is what were they doing to cause the cluster to emerge, exactly? They were just sort of shaking up the earth, giving the land a rubdown? I guess they were trying to shake the cluster awake, burst its bubble? Problem there is that, according to calculations I did in an old video of mine, the cluster is about 700 kilometers or 435 miles within the earth. 
the Han spaceship merely shaking the land's surface, and not even intensely enough to destroy Beach City at that, wouldn't translate to any noticeable effect on an object buried 700 kilometers down. If the spaceship was doing something beyond simply vibrating the Earth's surface layer, that certainly wasn't made clear to us as an audience. But hey, I've said it before, and I'm sure I'll say it many times over, Steven Universe really doesn't care about depicting physics with any sort of realism. Like, at all. So it's something that we as an audience just have to let slide and accept it for what it is. With some musical help from Greg, Steven manages to fall asleep so he can communicate with the cluster, but this interaction lasts a whopping total of 12 seconds. I feel like they may as well have cut this bit out entirely, considering how crammed and rushed it all felt. I mean, the cluster would have remembered what Steven did for it anyway, so siding with the Crystal Gems after emerging from its bubbled state of rumination would have sufficed without Steven's extremely quick communion with it. But yeah, the cluster has now become Earth's bodyguard, in the form of a giant, skinless arm. And it happens to coincidentally match the exact size of the homeworld chips, just so it can engage in an arm wrestling competition with them. Which is super silly and stupid, but I love it. I think that's the best kind of silly and stupid. I thought that was great, even if it does sort of kill the more serious tone and the feeling that all our characters are in mortal peril. While the yellow ship is occupied with the cluster, Blue decides to come down in front of the temple for some direct action. And I may as well drop this criticism here. I feel like it's absolutely ridiculous for two diamonds to go to Earth by themselves with zero bodyguards or backup troops of any kind. Yes, they're supremely powerful, yes, they've gotten reports on the Crystal Gem forces and thus know the opposition is slim, but still, come on. Especially so considering they thought Pink was spelled with some kind of dirty trick. It's ridiculous for two of the most important gems of Homeworld to engage with hostile forces thought to use backhanded tactics with no foot soldiers to back them up just in the off chance that something goes wrong. The diamonds coming to Earth alone, I just cannot see that as anything but a contrivance to make the plot work as envisioned. As for another nitpick, Steven taking a blue diamond energy blast to the face and coming out entirely unscathed felt really odd. I think he should have been made to pop a shield or bubble at the last moment to make it more believable. As is, that interaction just made Blue's firepower seem like a complete non-issue. Blue shattering Rose's sword between her fingers, though, that was really cool, and could work to symbolically denote that the last deceptive bit of Rose's legacy is behind us, as by the episode's end, the diamonds are made aware of the truth. I also feel like it's now inevitable for Bismuth to make a sword that better suits Connie for future combat. So yeah, Blue Diamond in action, her main weapon seems to be her grief that has festered for thousands of years. She has taken the sadness and is able to weaponize it against others to render them incapable of fighting, which means it's time for Lapis to make her expected return in a moment of need. You could drop the barn on the beach. What? Lapis also gets to make a pretty cool remark when her own depression allows her to ignore Blue Diamond's ability. I've felt worse. Real talk though, all I could think of during this scene was a similar scenario from the thriller Bark arc of One Piece, where a character named Perona has an ability to summon ghosts that make people feel so negative they can no longer fight. But this ability fails to work on Usopp because he already views the world with an extremely negative perspective. Rebecca Sugar is actually a fan of One Piece, and I've read, although from unreliable sources, that Usopp is one of her favorite characters, so I wouldn't be surprised if this Lapis scenario was actually inspired directly from events that occurred in One Piece. So after Lapis returns, we get our big group battle where the Crystal Gems work in unison to be on par with the Diamond for a short while, and I thought it was quite well done. Steven Universe's appeal isn't exactly its intricate battles, 
but this one was fun. I especially appreciate how the moment where everybody places their hand on Steven's shield to signify their unity was done fairly quick instead of taking its time. While many events after the wedding in this episode felt extremely rushed in terms of pacing, I found the entirety of the Crystal Gems vs. Blue Diamond fight very well paced. After the cluster served its plot purpose to hold off Yellow for a bit, it retreats back into the Earth's mantle, apparently now capable of keeping itself from forming without a bubble for some reason. It can just now suddenly do that. I guess. Huh. Anyway, Yellow Diamond gives Steven the boot, and we fade to black in a manner that leaves quite the impact, but also feels very familiar. And at this point, I may as well bring up another issue I had with this episode. It had so many similarities to the episode The Return. A sense of overwhelming danger from the arrival of homeworld forces, a standoff on the beach in front of the temple, a gem getting poofed, which incidentally, Yellow Diamond's zap power seems really similar to the gem technology we've seen used earlier to destabilize gems. And of course, Steven gets knocked out with a fade to black both times as well. There was enough overlap for Reunited to remind me of The Return multiple times, and honestly, I liked The Return a whole lot more. So it's rather awkward, I guess. You're watching this major development in the series, but you just can't help but be reminded of a far older episode that you enjoyed more because the events were staged in such a similar way. I've seen some people complain about how Steven saves the day because his latent powers bail him out yet again, but personally, I don't mind this too much. It's actually been a recurring motif throughout the show for Steven's accomplishments to be part luck from his powers activating on their own, and part dedicated effort on his part after the fact. As just one example of many, when confronting the cluster, Steven passes out and is able to communicate with it through no real effort of his own, but when it comes to convincing the cluster and bubbling it, Steven has to muster up his own effort and power. Steven often overcomes challenges by following up after a convenient opportunity presents itself, and I've long since gotten used to this, so it doesn't bother me, but I can see how such a recurring formula could start to grate on others. However, I do think the Crystal Gems being able to hold off not one, but two diamonds in battle without getting completely dominated was hard to swallow. The way Connie's and Astral Steven's interactions were framed made it seem like his astral actions were happening in real time, but even if they weren't, Garnet, Amethyst, Pearl, and Bismuth fighting on par with two diamonds for longer than a few seconds is not something they should be capable of, in my opinion. I also feel like if Steven's presence suddenly appeared with no warning while you were fighting for your life, it might just serve as a split-second fatal distraction rather than an emotional boost. But I'm just being overly nitpicky here. Of all of Steven's astral pep talks, Pearl's was my favorite. Everything I do, I do it for her! I do it for him! Don't forget about yourself, Pearl! I do it for me! And when it comes to psychic-y, astral-esque powers, it seems all diamonds may have some form of psychic competency, as Blue and Yellow are able to fend off Steven's astral form before he lets loose with a surge of psychic energy. For Blue, this makes sense, as obviously she can project her feelings of grief onto others, but I found it interesting that Yellow was capable as well. And I guess I should mention that any vagueness and ambiguity about Yellow's motivations and feelings about Pink Diamond since the court scene have been settled as of this episode. The reason she responded so violently back then is both due to the outrage of the instigation that she helped in Pink's demise, but also because she actually feels like she did help in Pink's demise. She feels guilty over letting Pink have a colony when she wasn't ready for one, and thinks it's her fault that Pink ended up shattered. So yeah, let's wind down this review. The episode ends with Yellow and Blue realizing who Steven is, and this marks our entry into the next phase of Steven Universe's story. As the title of this video already indicates, I did generally like the content of the episode and thought it was quite good, some nitpicks aside. But that pacing, oh man, it was just way too rushed after the wedding portion ended. 
I felt like a lot of times I couldn't even have a legitimate emotional reaction to a certain scene because we were already on to the next event. Nothing had a chance to really sit with you or leave an impact. Too much stuff to cover, we gotta move, 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 move. Still, overall, I would give Reunited a thumbs up, even though I think plot developments of this magnitude should have been given far more focus and time. Unfortunately, the next episode is also extremely fast-paced, so I don't know, I hope Steven Universe gets its pacing issues sorted out sooner than later. See you in the next review.